Hi, this is Pauline Ng. Um, I wrote this paper in 2009, and I've given this talk several times, so I decided to put it on YouTube. This is about an agenda for personalized medicine, where I compare the differences between 23andMe and Navigenics. So, the price of sequencing has decreased, and pretty soon we will reach a $1,000 genome. Now, why are we sequencing? We want to sequence in order to obtain personal, personalized medicine. Jim Watson and Craig Venter were the first genomes to be sequenced, and we, when we looked at their sequences, specifically at the CYP2D6 gene, um, and this gene metabolizes beta blockers, antipsychotics, and antidepressants, what we found was that while Craig Venter was wild type uh, for CYP2D6 gene, that is, he's normal, Jim Watson actually had, um, was homozygous for the STAR-10 allele. And the STAR-10 is known to have decreased activity. It's extremely rare in Caucasians, and so you wouldn't expect that he would have this allele, but nevertheless, his genome sequence, according to 454 sequencing, said he did. And so what we would predict based on his genome sequence is that he metabolizes drugs differently, and therefore you would give him a different drug dosage. And this is what's revealed by genome sequencing. So um, direct-to-consumer companies like 23andMe and Navigenics today uh, don't uh, um, offer genotyping, um, and this ranges in $100 to $1,000, and this price is decreasing. These companies are looking not at your complete genome sequence, but actually um, at hundreds of thousands or uh, uh, up to a million points in your genome. And by scanning these positions in your genome, they can predict disease risks, your ancestry, physical traits, and pharmacogenomic markers. So one of the questions we ask is whether this was useful. So if you get a disease risk prediction from one of these companies, would you expect the predictions to be consistent? That is, would you expect the Navigenics prediction to agree with the 23andMe predictions? And I would argue yes, because it's science, it's about, you know, and it's also about disease risk. So if you go to one doctor and you get a diagnosis, you would hope that if you went to another doctor, uh, you know, in another hospital, but the same day, you should be getting the same diagnosis. And this is about consistency. So we had uh, several individuals submit their DNA to Navigenics and 23andMe. So it's the same individual, the same DNA, to two different companies. And this is an example of an individual's predictions. Um, this is a list of predictions of diseases that were predicted by both, by both companies. And this female, if you look at the top row, had an increased risk of breast cancer by both Navigenics and 23andMe. Now, for Crohn's disease, Navigenics predicted an increased risk of Crohn's disease, while 23andMe predicted a decreased risk of Crohn's disease. And so if it's white, that means the predictions agree, and if it's colored in pink, that means that the predictions disagree. We had five individuals overall that submitted their DNA to both 23andMe and Navigenics, and you can see that their predictions are shown here, where an up arrow is increased risk, a down arrow is decreased risk, and an uh, equal sign is average risk. So if the cell is in blue, then that means that the predictions agree. So for breast cancer, female A had increased risk by both companies. Now, if the cell is in yellow, that means that the two companies disagreed with predictions. So, for example, Crohn's disease, uh, female A, one company predicted a decreased risk, while another company uh, predicted an increased risk. And what you can see is that there's a lot of yellow in this table. That is, there are a lot of places where the companies disagree. So about one-third predictions disagree for each individual which means that if you were to pay both companies, submit your DNA to both companies and pay both companies, about a third of the predictions would disagree. Um, but we also see that some diseases agree better than others. So for example, for breast cancer, you can see that um, all of the predictions agree for all of the individuals, all of the females. For celiac disease, all of the predictions agree for all of the individuals. Okay, so we wanted to explore why there were all of these disagreements. And to explain that, I have to explain the direct-to-consumer method for calculating disease risk. 
So what happens is that you send in your spit and, uh, sorry, your saliva, and um, the companies genotype your saliva. From your saliva, they get a list of personal variants, your DNA genotypes that are unique to you, and they intersect it with a database of known risk markers culled from the research literature, uh, which is research done by researchers uh, in the genetics field. They intersect the database of known risk markers with your list of personal genotypes, and then they put it in a calculator, and they calculate personal disease risks. Now one thing to realize is that there are unknown risk factors, so other genetic risk factors that have not yet been discovered, environmental factors, and epigenetic factors. And the companies do a really good job explaining what, has, what, is, unex un, what is not yet explained. But let's explore this database of known risk markers further. So when we compare the markers between the two companies, we see that there's not that not as much overlap as we'd hope between the two companies. That is, the companies use different disease markers. So in purple are markers that are shared between Navigenics and 23andMe, and that's here, shown in purple. And in red is when Navigenics only uses a marker and 23andMe does not. In blue is when it's a 23andMe marker only, shown here in blue. Um, and then there are some ambiguous markers that we could not uh, distinguish. So what we would hope is that for these diseases that you'd see all purple, that all of the markers are, are used by Nanovigenics and 23andMe, and they're using the same set of disease markers. But you can see that for every disease, they're using a different set of markers, and that's because a different criteria is being used. Um, this is an example of uh, psoriasis, where predictions between the two t companies disagree uh, for half of the individuals. So in one, indiv one individual, 23andMe predicted that this person had a risk of psoriasis, psoriasis 43%, while Nav Navigenics predicted a risk of 5%. So it's vastly different predictions. And so when we look at the markers, um, 23andMe is using this marker with an adjusted odds ratio close to 5, whereas, uh, and then both companies are using these two markers with an odds ratio close to 1. So this marker is what's really the deciding factor for 23andMe. Now, we look at celiac disease where predictions agreed for all of the individuals, and it's not the number of markers, but it's the type of marker that's being used. So in celiac disease, the same high-risk marker is being used. This marker is the same between 23andMe and Navigenics, and it has an adjusted odds ratio of close to 25. Meanwhile, Navigenics has an additional seven markers, but their odds ratio is close to one. So this is really, this marker that's close to 25 is really the deciding factor for the prediction, and the rest of the markers are just kind of noise. Um, and, just kind of noise, and it's really this marker that decides um, the majority of the prediction. So in predicting disease risk, sorry, in predicting disease risks, the number of markers do not matter. It's the markers with large effect sizes that matter. So when the same large effect mark markers are used, you see consistent predictions between the two companies. And when you differ on the large effect markers, your predictions will differ. Okay, so in this paper, we proposed using prospective studies, full sequencing rather than genotyping to, uh, to get other genetic factors, replicating associated markers in other ethnicities because the majority of these studies are done in Caucasian populations, and to explore environmental and other unknown factors when looking at disease. This, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the companies 23andMe and Navigenics for donating their tests. The donors of, uh, who donated their DNA, and the other authors of this paper, Sarah Murray, Sam Le Levy, and Craig Venter. <laughs>